Thank you very much. After so much optimism, what can I do? Um, I was asked to talk about Turkey, and uh, Turkey has already been mentioned a number of times. So let me try to put uh, all these views into a perspective uh, from a, a Turkish perspective, but not Turkey's perspective. Um, Turkey has gone through a number of phases as far as Middle East is as concerned, and I think has come to a full circle, almost full circle. Uh, maybe in a couple of years we, we finish that circle. Uh, let me explain what I mean. Um, during the most of 20th century, uh, Turkey did not consider itself as part of the Middle East. Um, with the Atatürk's revolution, a cultural revolution, um, Turkey somewhat turned its back for that culture. Not the region, but to the culture. So because of that, um, uh, it looked towards Europe, towards the West in general. Uh, most of its uh, foreign relations and international connections were, was, uh, were with the European Union, European countries, later on European Union, and also West in general. Of course, become member of NATO, become member of founding member of uh, European Council, etc. Uh, but this was not all, of course. Um, it was partly cultural, but partly security reasons also during the 20th century. Uh, when Turkey looked to the east or south, it saw only conflict. Uh, when it looked to the west, uh, to Europe, it saw uh, a developing region uh, in peaceful relationships. So that was the, there was an attraction there. There was a, a, a input from the Middle East uh, not to be involved. So that was kind of an official has become had become an official about party politics that Turkey would not be uh, interfere in the affairs of Middle Eastern states. Um, that was the 20th century. Of course, the life has changed in uh, 1991. Uh, the Cold War ended, 20th century ended before the, uh, it officially ended, uh, and the new century brought new geopolitical realities. Uh, from the Turkish perspective, when you are sitting in Ankara, uh, the new um, era uh, prompted Turkey to be more interested in its, uh, in its neighborhood. Uh, during the Cold War, of course, Turkey being part of one of the alliances, uh, most of Turkey's foreign and, uh, and especially the security policies were determined or it was part of the global, uh, global fight or global struggle. Uh, but once that struggle uh, removed and Turkey suddenly found itself, uh, its geography expanded, uh, expanded to the Central, uh, Central uh, Asia, expanded to the Balkans and expanded to the Middle East. Uh, when Turkey suddenly again found itself uh, almost alone in its geography to face old style of uh, threats while its allies in Europe and in, in, the, in the West uh, actually were enjoying uh, the fruits of a peaceful moment of history. So that, that was the moment when Turkey started to uh, moving uh, in its perception, moving from Europe to the Middle East, although we didn't admit it to ourselves at, at that time. Um, even during the uh, 20th century when Turkey thought that it was not part of the Middle East, uh, it was nevertheless a big country, so it was part of the Middle East in reality. Uh, so in, in its affairs in the Republican uh, era, it occasionally attempted to play an active role, um, such as in 1937, Sadabat Pact was established by Turkey, or 1955, uh, Baghdad Pact was again established by Turkey. Of course, these, uh, these pact did not make Turkey a darling of Arab world in, in general, in the Middle East. Uh, but after the end of the Cold War, when Turkey was looking different regions uh, for its uh, economic uh, development and for its exporting needs and etc., Middle East was one of the regions that Turkey um, decided that it could focus on. Um, this brought a new kind of an outlook, but this was a, a kind of a, a perspective, a shift in Turkish thinking, uh, but it was not materialized up until, uh, almost up until uh, Justice and Development Party came to power in 2002. Why it was not really materialized? Because there was a, 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 a tectonic shift in the Middle East also. 
a continuous warfare. Uh, once uh, Iran-Iraq war ended, we, uh, we had the first Gulf War uh, in 1991. Uh, its, ef its effects continued until the second war in Iraq in 2003 when the United States invaded. When it finished, uh, we moved into Syria. So this kind of a, 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 a perspective looking from Turkey uh, brought an understanding of the region from a security and strategic uh, per perception. When you look at it from the security perspective for Turkey, uh, after the end of the Cold War, most important issues was were uh, prevention of uh, PKK, that's the Kurdish uh, guerrilla group from Turkey, uh, operating from Middle Eastern countries, first from Syria, then from Iraq, attacking Turkey. So that was the first priority, how to stop this and how to um, struggle with it. The second priority has become how to prevent instability of the region uh, uh, spilling over into Turkey, starting from the Gulf War onwards. Uh, in, in this kind of environment, uh, 1999 was an important watershed. Uh, when Turkey threatened uh, Syria to go to war if it's continued to harbor the leader of PKK. Uh, in Damascus, actually. Uh, at the time, Syria couldn't um, withstand the threat, so they sent him abroad, and that brought a kind of a, a, a rapprochement, long, rap long lost rapprochement with Syria. And uh, that was a very interesting uh, moment uh, and turnabout for Turkey's policy towards Syria because um, during the 20th century, when two countries, uh, after Syria became independent, uh, two countries never really managed to go along. Uh, there were animosities of history and etc. Uh, but after 1999, uh, with the threat of war, uh, two countries came, came to an understanding. They in fact signed an accord, uh, Adana Accords in 1999, and the relationship started to move very fast. Um, but 2002 is another important watershed in Turkish politics, domestic politics and foreign policy, because Justice and Development Party, with its uh, foundations and connections with political Islam, uh, came to power uh, uh, as a majority party in the parliament and stayed there up until today. Uh, and in, in fact, not only stayed as a governing party, but it has increased its votes uh, within the society and its support within the society, so much so that in the last elections, we had just had um, elections in June. Uh, the, the president now, we, have, we moved, decided to move last year to presidential system, and the current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is also the leader of Justice and Development Party. He received 52% of the votes. When AKP came to power in 2002, it was 40, uh, 34%. So instead of losing uh, in the power, they keep steadily uh, gaining, and uh, by the way, there, was, there has been 18 elections since 2002 up till today, um, local and general and etc. They won all of them. So we are not talking a, a, a passing phase here. Um, with AKP, there came a number of things. One is AKP has been, or Justice and Development Party, has been a representative of the sociological change in Turkey. Turkish society that most of us has failed to uh, uh, fail to foresee. Uh, that was the rise of uh, middle classes, uh, a pupils, uh, more conservative middle classes, uh, who started to moving to the cities much before the Arabs started to moving to cities. In Turkey, this internal immigration has started in 1950s, came up to uh, its, its fastest phase in 1970s. Uh, and by the 1990s, um, Turkish uh, uh, cities have covers now uh, more than 70, then more than 70 percent of the population. Now it's 80 percent. So 80 percent of Turkish population today lives in the cities. Again, not all of them, of course, have the background of uh, uh, normally uh, people who live in the city, some of them are villagers and etc. Uh, they come and uh, etc. But these, these, are, these are the people who are actually voting and must um, to, to the AKP. But at the same time, in, from the 1980 onwards, 
uh, we had a liberal le revolution, economic liberal revolution in Turkey, uh, liberalizing Turkish economy, integrating into the world, and etc. This helped what we call Anatolian bourgeoisie to develop, uh, which is actually uh, more conservative than the Turk traditional Turkish Istanbul-based bourgeoisie, which again supported the AKP. So these these bases are actually were and are still are in favor of Turkey's expanding its connections and relationship with the Middle Eastern countries or Muslim countries in general. Sometimes, of course, the, the idea is, is coached again in terms of Middle East, sometimes Muslim countries, sometimes former Ottoman countries, sometimes Turkic countries, but it's nevertheless, it's, it's the same idea, actually. Um, so uh, the second, another area that AKP brought into the politics was the change. Because they were not, they were not part of the establishment, traditional establishment of Turkey, uh, uh, you know, the, from the, the center, left and right parties. They were, in a sense, coming outside from the system. So they wanted to change the system. They wanted how the Tur traditional Turkish foreign policy has been running. And one of the complaints that AKP had was that Turkish foreign policy was focusing too much on security issues, therefore conflicts. So they wanted to change that, to change that, to focus more on collaboration uh, and cooperation within its neighborhood. Uh, of course, this also helped Turkey's looking into the, into the Middle East. So with these ideas, then uh, at the time, the advisor to the minister, uh, foreign affairs advisor, then he became a minister of foreign affairs, then the prime minister, Mr. Ahmed Davutoğlu, or Professor Ahmed Davutoğlu, actually, uh, he imagined a world uh, centered on Turkey uh, uh, and looking uh, and trying to connect different localities in the world to Central Asia, to Caucasia, to Europe, to Balkans, to the Middle East, to the Mediterranean, everything linking to Turkey because of Turkey's historical, uh, cultural, and national uh, standing. This was a kind of an imagination that caught the attention of uh, Justice and Development Party and most of, it, most of their intelligentsia, yeah, and it affected the foreign policy, of course. Uh, with these ideas in mind, uh, there emerged several, uh, uh, several new policy lines from, from the Turkish foreign policy. Um, Turkey started to implementing, for example, joint cabinet meetings with its neighboring countries. This started with, uh, uh, with Iraq, I think, if I remember correctly, Syria. then Syria, uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Azerbaijan, and Russia, finally. You know, we had implemented this joint, at the time, joint uh, cabinet meetings. Uh, then Turkey also implemented in the Middle East uh, free trade areas. Um, we signed free trade agreement with, uh, starting with Syria, then Iraq, then Jordan, uh, and one, when the Syrian civil war uh, started, the discussion was to create a region-based free trade area that they, they, they call a Mediterranean Four or Levant Business Forum. So this was a, a kind of a, a, a using Turkey's soft power, um, trying to gain foothold in the region. And also at the time, Turkey also put itself as a as a, 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 a doer, a, a solver of the problems, go between, you know, any country who had any problem with any, anybody else, uh, Ahmed Davutoğlu uh, and the foreign ministry was there trying to solve that problem. Um, so we tried to mediate between Israel and Palestinians, within the Palestinians, between uh, Hamas and, uh, and Fatah, uh, and also between Syria and Israel, uh, between Iran and the West, and etc., uh, and number of others uh, out of the region, but that these are the within the region. Um, at at a, at a time, it looked very nice. Uh, up until 2013, actually, uh, 2007, actually. Um, by the time 2007, uh, Turkey was seen as a yet again from the West as a model. Uh, this is the third time in my lifetime that Turkey is seen as a model to somewhere. Uh, but again, from the West, not from Turkey, it, 
the idea, this kind of ideas usually come from the West, from the United States it starts, and it, it, it comes to Turkey, and then everybody gets excited. So Turkey was again presented as a model to Middle Eastern Arab countries uh, to emulate. Uh, why? Because there was this Al-Qaeda model, uh, where this was, there was this Iranian model, and there was this actually Saudi model that nobody talked too much. But then there was this Turkish model, which was a, a, a Muslim majority country, liberal economy, democratizing democratizing country, trying to be part of a European Union. So that was a very good model, you know. Instead of radical Islam, liberal, moderate Islamic model. Uh, what crushed all this is two things. Uh, one is, I think, is that uh, this all this success, uh, all this imagination, and all this voila, uh, got the head of um, AKP leaders. They started thinking that Turkey could do anything and everything. They started to imagining a world that is not only centered around Turkey, but it, but it's shaped by Turkey. Um, so. Ahmed Davutoglu's uh, uh, zero problem with neighbors policy uh, turned into Turkey as an order builder in the Middle East. You know, these are two mottos that he used uh, when he was speaking to Turkish diplomats in its uh, yearly in his yearly meetings. So when Turkey moved from zero problem with neighbors to order builder model, then it actually renounced its soft power ability of using its soft power try to turn it turn back the clock into the hard power and at this time of course Turkey and one of its partners uh, in the Middle East one of its good partners in the Middle East Israel started to fight with each other well I'm not really fighting but you know disputing um, uh, with no, uh, the, the problems actually started in 2008. Uh, with the operation Kaslet, Kaslet. Ka uh, in Gaza uh, with Israel. At the time, Prime Minister Erdogan was um, annoyed immensely because he was thinking that he was at the moment uh, moderating and, and, and finding um, the, the ways between Israel and Palestinians and between Israel and Syria and everything has collapsed within a day. So he was so angry about it. But it started from then onwards and we, we haven't yet seen the bottom of it. Uh, it moved down. Uh, also, uh, everything was put into a swear test, uh, very difficult uh, test uh, with the Arab Spring. When the Arab Spring started, Turkey took the, I would say, very, uh, uh, very model, very pro-populations, uh, position. You know, we started supporting uh, people against the governments in, in Egypt. That paid off, the Barak gun. Uh, in Libya, you know, it was kind of difficult for Turkey to do what, uh, to, to, to choose the site, but eventually again Turkey uh, chose the site of the population, general population against Qaddafi. Uh, when it came to Syria in 2011, Looking into the forces of uh, uh, changing forces of Arab Spring in different countries, what we know now, well, not what everybody knows now, but what I knew then and told <laughs> so, uh, the government miscalculated its hands. It's not only me. I mean, lots of people in Turkey was we all told that the government was miscalculating. They miscalculated the power of Turkey over Syria. They miscalculated the ability of Bashar Assad to stay in power. Uh, they miscalculated um, the, the stakes of uh, uh, Russia and Iran to help um, Syria. Uh, and th they miscalculate the power of uh, opposition in Syria. So all these miscalculations uh, brought Turkey into a policy of regime change in Syria. 
By the way, this is the first time in Turkish Republican history that Turkey is attempting a regime change in its neighboring country. So this is against all Turkish traditional foreign policy, and not only foreign policy in the Middle East, but in general. But especially in the Middle East, of course, the policy of not to interfering in the affairs of neighboring countries was come to crashing down with the trying to change the regime in Israel, uh, in, in Syria, of course. In Israel, we haven't done that yet. yet. <laughs> Um, and, of, and of course, as everybody warned, as everybody warned, um, what I'm going to say would be understood here very well, Turkey became Pakistan of Afghanistan, right? We became Pakistan of Syria. And all these uh, jihadis, global jihadis, uh, moving into the Syria, uh, they found way, one of the ways were through Turkey, of course. Uh, and by the way, contrary to arguments, Turkey is not only to blame, of course. Yeah? Let us not forget the initial uh, guns, ammunition to uh, opposition groups in Syria came from Libya, bought by Saudi and Qatari money, brokered by Israeli and Americans, you know, transported into Turkey by the Saudi Airlines, and from Turkey, it's transported to Syria for, by the Turkish intelligence. So it was a collaborative effort. You know, it's not Turkey alone. Uh, but of course, this is uh, we are the neighbors. As we say, we are going to be here forever. The others might leave, but we are there. Uh, but so Turkey is now facing the problems of, uh, of consequences of that mistake. Uh, but eventually, um, when uh, uh, the problem of ISIS uh, emerged and, and uh, it brought the global involvement with the United States and also uh, uh, Russia, the, the, the geopolitical understanding and strategic understanding has changed immensely for Turkey. Suddenly, Turkey found itself not only dealing with the, um, this uh, uh, non-state actors, and Syria regime and etc. But suddenly we found uh, the two global powers on our doorstep again. We don't. We never wanted that, but that's uh, unintended consequences. After 2015, with the Russian uh, involvement in the conflict, it became a global issue to manage. And from then onwards, Turkey has started to changing its policy without by the government without acknowledging that it made mistake. Of course, if you are in government, you never acknowledge that you made a mistake. But they have changed the policy. Now, Turkish policy in Syria has become uh, um, focused, not the removal of al-Assad, which was up until 2015, but to prevent spillover effect of the conflict into Turkey. There are a number of issues that could spill over into Turkey. But from the Turkish security perspective, of course, most of the biggest challenge is the Kurdish, uh, the, the future of the Kurdish groups in Syria, whether they are going to control the border areas next to Turkey. And of course, why it's the biggest challenge? Because from Turkish perspective, and I think which 95% is correct, the Kurdish groups in Syria are much con under the control of the PKK, which is fighting with Turkey. Um, uh, since 1984. Uh, to, on top of all this, to complicate all of this, United States decided to ally itself with the Kurdish groups. And Turkey decided to act alone uh, and, and stage two operations in Syria. Suddenly, we found ourselves to, to governing two areas within the Syria and kind of a half governing the third area, which is Idlib. Now everybody is focusing, and, and the Russians started to bombing, I think, yesterday. And everybody is now expecting a war in Idlib, uh, the, the, the regime forces to enter Idlib, and Turkey is trying to monitor what we call the, the escalation zone in Idlib, uh, which agreed with Russia, uh, Iran, and Turkey as set up by, by that agreement. Um, the fear is, of course, that when this war 
um, starts or the operation starts. It's not the war, it's the operation starts against Idlib. Uh, there are three plus million people living in, in the area. Most of them, well, not most of them, some of them, let's say, uh, jihadis. And the fear is that most of them will be moving into Turkey. On top of that, on top of uh, 3.7 million Syrians already living in Turkey as refugees. Uh, and of course, the biggest fear is not only the refugees, that's a problem, but the possibility of jihadists, especially the foreign jihadists, who are now in Idlib, might and most probably will move with the refugees into Turkey. So how to deal with them, what to do with them, how to separate them from the civilians uh, would be a, a big problem. And also how to isolate Turkish control areas in Syria without being affected uh, from this conflict. Uh, is the current uh, discussion. And on, on all of this, of course, Turkey is trying to manage, yet again, a very, a very tight position uh, between uh, United States, which we are fighting on the separately, disputing separately in NATO and in economy, and etc., uh, and also, be, also the Russia, which we seem to be cooperating, but at the same time not cooperating. So we'll, we'll try to balance that too. So this is kind of uh, currently Turkey's Middle East policy. When everybody is focusing in this, Turkey at the same time silently, without many people noticing, have been staging an operation in Iraq, which was involved, which has involved as many um, soldiers as many we had in Syria. So, but we are not talking about it. It's hush. So let me stop here. Professor, 